Good morning. Good to see all of your smiling faces today. Thank you for coming out and being a part of our service at Victory Church here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. The leaves are turning. Man, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful part of the country to live in, isn't it? Hallelujah. Well, I would like for you to turn with me in your Bible, please, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. And we are going to pick up where we left off last week. I shared with you we are the, the title of this teaching, uh, and I likely will finish it today, is the uh, Ephesians prayers. Now, there are... There are two prayers in the book of Ephesians, and I believe, now this next part is my personal opinion. It is my opinion that about 90 to 95% of the trouble that you go through can be solved by praying one of these two prayers. Oftentimes what happens, and I kind of alluded to this last week, and I didn't go into the detail that I, that I meant to. Oftentimes what happens is we react to something by thinking that prayer is the answer. Now, now listen, let me stop right here. Is prayer important? Absolutely prayer is important. Don't go out of here saying, Pastor Seymour said he didn't believe in prayer. That, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, is oftentimes when we are faced with situations, with circumstances, with challenges that come in our life, our reaction is to pray or to get other people to pray, get the prayer chain going, all kinds of stuff like that. If you'll notice, whenever Jesus, and, and he is a really good person to pattern our lives after, you look at the way that Jesus ministered. Because the church has been commissioned to do those works. And we've talked about this uh, in depth over the last several weeks. Actually, the last couple of three months. And so what happens is, is when we're faced with a challenge in our life, we, we, our reaction oftentimes is, well, I need to pray about this. Prayer is really important. But oftentimes what we miss is, it's not prayer that needs to, be, to handle the situation. It's us standing in authority and decreeing something and commanding something to happen. When Jesus went into cities and there were people that would come up to him with a woman with issue of blood. Y'all remember the woman with issue of blood? Mark chapter 5. She came in and she said, if I can just but touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. And so she comes through the press behind. Remember, Jesus was a rock star. There were people all around him, thronging him everywhere he went. This woman pushes through all of that in a weakened condition, reaches out and touches the hem of his garment. And Jesus stops. And he turns around and he said, somebody touch me. And they said, Master, come on, you've got to be kidding. There are people here, of course somebody touched you. We, we, we've lost Nathaniel three times. He's gotten knocked down. We're not even sure where he is right now. They, he said, no, 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 somebody touched me. I felt, King James Bible says, I felt virtue go out of me. That word virtue is the word power, dunamis, we talked about last week. The word dunamis. He said, I felt power go out. Now, that woman, when she came into him and touched him, she didn't ask for prayer. Jesus didn't say, let's all just join hands right now together, sing Michael, row your boat ashore, kumbaya, and, would you, and, and light a few candles, and, and, and this will work. That isn't what happened. There was, matter of fact, Jesus didn't pray for the woman at all. He, she came in, and, and, it, and by her faith, matter of fact, he said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. So whenever people were brought to Jesus, he didn't have a prayer meeting. He commanded something to happen. Rise up, or right, take your bed and walk. Go show yourself to the priests. Daughter, your sins are forgiven. He, he gave commands. That is, that is what the way that we walk as believers in authority. Now then. Where prayer comes in, prayer is our communication and fellowship with the Father. That's that intimate time of building relationship. That's that intimate time of just spending time with the creator of the universe, praising him and thanking him for the, thing that, the things that he has done just because he's God, and that's praise. And then thanksgiving are for the specific things he's done for you. Prayer builds that relationship and that intimacy 
that helps you go out and do these other things that I'm talking about. But oftentimes in believers' lives, when sickness is concerned, where lack or poverty is concerned, the thing that is necessary is standing on the Word, believing it in your heart, and saying it with your mouth, giving voice to something. Remember, faith lives in two places. It lives in your heart and in your mouth. You have to give voice to what it is that you're believing. Isn't that the way you get saved? Romans 10, 9 and 10, you believe in your heart that God uh, has raised Jesus from the dead and you confess, you give voice to it. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Well, that is, the Bible refers to that as a confession, we substitute the word prayer, of faith. That's the way that the prayer of faith or confession of faith operates. That's the same whether it's in salvation for you to become born again or that's the same where healing is concerned, that is where that is used. So here in the book of Ephesians, we looked last week at the prayer in, in Ephesians chapter 1, and you know, a very interesting thing that we found out, and I, 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 I've noticed over the years as a pastor, that more often times than not, the reason that people need to come and talk with me usually has to do with vision and direction. They've got, they're trying to make a decision. Do I take this job? They're trying to make a decision. Do we move to this city? They're try, and, and so they're trying to find out what God's will is in this particular area. This is an area where you would spend time in prayer. This is when you would spend time in prayer to get vision and direction. By the way, vision and direction is just as much a part of your covenant as the new birth. It's just as much a part of your covenant as healing, as peace, as prosperity, as joy and goodness and all of the vision and direction is just as much a part. God doesn't want you wandering around aimlessly. He, 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 he has a specific plan for you, Jeremiah 29, 11 says. It's to give you a hope and a future. He desires good things for us. And he's not withholding that vision. He wants us to know. It's just that uh, sometimes we don't spend the time necessary to find out what that is. Uh, this church, you know, this, this uh, the Lord told us on November the 11th, 1986. Do y'all remember what day of the week, November the 11th, 1986 was? Tuesday. Oh, I see you've heard this story before. Beth and I were out at uh, Dry Gulch, USA, right outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I'm standing there talking to one of the ministers. Beth and I were one of the first couples that attended a uh, children's workshop out there. We were children's ministers at the time. And uh, I was sitting there talking to one of the guest ministers who actually he'll be here January the 8th. He's here with us every year. He'll be here again on Sunday, January the 8th, uh, Joe McGee. And so I was talking to him. And as I was talking to him, the Lord told me, he said, you'll be going to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And so we came home, and two weeks later, we're riding around, and, and we, we, Beth and I worked the same place, worked the same church at the time. We're riding home, and uh, Beth said, you know, when we were out at Dry Gulch, she said, I was getting a drink of water, and she was. We were in the dining hall, and she was to my left down here at the water fountain. And she said, I was getting a drink of water, and when I stood up and turned and looked at you and Joe talking, she said, the Lord told me we'd be going to Chattanooga, Tennessee. I said, really? So I pulled the car over. I said, Really? Did he tell you when we'd be going? He, she said, no. I said, he didn't tell me either. So on February the 23rd, 1993, at 5.55 p.m., which was on a Tuesday, that's exactly right. You've heard this story, too. Um, we were in Rockford, Illinois, on staff at a church. And I had come home from work. Beth was preparing supper, and I just went to lay down. We were living in a little apartment, and our house in Birmingham hadn't sold at the time. So we're living in a little apartment up there, and uh, Beth's uh, slicing a tomato. And so I, I, I um, uh, well, let me back up. So I, I'd come home that day on February the 23rd, and I'd lay down just to take a nap or just rest till supper was ready. And I was kind of reading my Bible and kind of trying to relax and maybe praying, and I wasn't doing any of them very well. And I, as I was laying there, the Lord told me, he said, I want you to go to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and start a church. See, he didn't tell me that in in 86 but this time he said i want you to go to out of new tennessee and start a church so i didn't say anything to beth i prayed about it and about two weeks later she was slicing the tomato and i walked in there kind of in the, the kitchen 
dining room area. And, and uh, she said, you know, I believe when we go to Chattanooga, we're supposed to start a church in Chattanooga. I said, you know, I said, the Lord told me the exact same thing. That's what you're a part of. That's, that's how we got here. So on February the, 20, or February the 13th, 1994, which was on a Sunday, don't you say Tuesday, that was a Sunday, uh, we had our first service here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And oh boy, the naysayers came out. What are you going to, Ch do you know how many churches there are in Chattanooga? Yep, at that time there were 756 churches in Chattanooga. There's over that, there's more than that now. 756 churches. Chattanooga did not need another church. I don't know if it needed another church or not, but I'm still going to do what, matter of fact, there was a group of people that got together and wanted us to come start a church about 20 miles from here. But it wasn't in Chattanooga. And they got highly offended that we didn't come down there and do that. And I told them, I said, look, I said, the Lord told me to come to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I'm not going to miss it by 20 miles. Okay? I mean, if he said come to Chattanooga, we're coming to Chattanooga. So we moved down here, started the church. And, I mean, we prayed starting in uh, uh, February the 23rd. We started praying for this church. Praying that the right people would get here. And they have over the years. I believe there's still a lot more that are still going to be here. So that's what I'm talking about where prayer is spent, where, where primarily vision and direction uh, is concerned. And that's what we find here in Ephesians chapter 1. If you hadn't found Ephesians chapter 1 yet, you're not going to find it. I'm going to go ahead and just go on. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17. Um, uh, matter of fact, verse 16 tells you that he's praying. Now remember, the book of Ephesians is what the big boys eat. The book of Ephesians is written to mature believers. The church at Ephesus, uh, the pastor of this church is Timothy. You know Timothy. You know Timothy of First and Second Timothy fame? <laughs> yep, see those letters are the Apostle Paul writing to the pastor, Timothy. This is an address to the church. So when you look at First and Second Timothy and the book of Ephesians, you get a picture of what, what's going on and what God's plan for this particular church is. So this is a very mature church. This is a mature church that had over 100,000 people. That's a big church, slightly a little bit bigger than what we are. 100,000 people. And Timothy had two very famous people in his congregation. Now, how would you like this? How would you like to be ministering and look out into your congregation and sitting on the front row, because you know these people would have had seats on the front row, and sitting on the front row would have been the Apostle John and Mary, the mother of Jesus. They attended his church. When the Apostle Paul was, I mean, when the Apostle John was sent into exile, he was sent in exile to Patmos. Patmos is just right off of where Ephesus is. It's just right off the coast there. So they were in this area when Jesus gave John charge of his mother, Mary. Uh, after a few years, they moved up into this region. So they went to Timothy's church. Man, <laughs> you know, that, that uh, you talk about having an expert on the Christmas story. You could just bounce things off of Mary. Just that, you know, not, that is the way that happened, right? So that's what's going, that's, that's who this is. That's what this church is. And the Apostle Paul says in verse 16, he says, I don't cease to make mention of you in my prayers. And then verse 17 starts, this is how I pray for you. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. So he says, I pray for you to have wisdom. And revelation, we would say vision and direction. That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of your calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now I want you to look at verse 18, it says that the eye, he said, I pray for you that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. We misuse this verse of scripture. We use this verse of scripture as a weapon against other people. And it usually goes something like this. Lord, I just want to lift so-and-so up to you, and I just pray that the eyes of their understanding be enlightened, and that they see that I was right. That's usually what this verse is used for, is somebody disagrees with you, and so you're praying and asking God 
that their eyes of their understanding be enlightened so they can see it your way. That is not what this is talking about. He is praying is, I want, he said, I pray for you. To, listen, I pray this prayer for me. I want the eyes of my understanding enlightened. This isn't a disagreement passage. This is a deeper revelation. This is going to a deeper level. This is a more intimate relationship with the things of God, with a relationship with the Father. That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. Why? That you may know what is the hope of His calling. That's Jesus' calling in your life. And what the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints. He said, I want you to have full understanding what your inheritance is. Your inheritance is, God says, I've given you richly all things to enjoy. I've given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. We have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And what that, that is significant because that means that the sin or the penalty of sin is no longer held against us. And by sin, I mean capital S sin, depravity, not works of the flesh that we usually refer to as sin. I'm talking about the big one that was committed in the Garden of Eden. So, we have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. We have been given the authority to use His name. You know that name that's the name that's above every name? that at that name, everything has to bow its knee. We have been given the authority to use that name. Hey, does cancer have a name? Does diabetes have a name? Yes. High blood pressure. COPD. LMNOQ. I, don't, I just made that up. I don't know. What... But all these things that, 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 that try to come against you. Poverty has a name. And at the name of Jesus, all of these things have to bow their knee. We've been given the authority to use that name. And then also, we have been empowered by the Spirit of the living God with the anointing of God that empowers us to do the works that Jesus did. He told us in John chapter 14, the works that I do shall you do also. So you've been, you, you have you're, there's no longer the penalty of sin that's held against us. We've been given the authority to use the name of Jesus, and we have been empowered, we have been given power to be able to do or to fulfill the Great Commission. That's pretty good. Um, we're coming way far short of what it is that God has enabled us and called us to do where this is concerned. Matter of fact, we still have people that don't believe in most of that stuff that I just told you. They're just hoping, they're just hanging on, hoping, dear God, hope, just hope, if I can just get to heaven, I'm just hanging on till I get to heaven. Look, my brother and sister, there are things that we need to be doing before we get to heaven. We're in a partnership. We are in a relationship. We are in a covenant with the creator of the universe that says, I want your help. Will you please help me get the gospel into all the world? And, I, and I'm equipping you to do that. So Paul says, I want you to understand all of that. I want the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened that you can understand all of these things. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power? Ooh, my goodness, this is a good one. And what is the, verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power? I love this word. This is the word dunamis. This is the miracle working power of God. This is raising the dead power. This is casting out devil power. This is healing the sick power. This is blind eyes open power. This is the deaf hearing power. I want the eyes of your understanding that you'll be able to know what the riches of the glory of his inheritance and what is the exceeding greatness of his power? Now you I want you you know what the word toward means? Doesn't doesn't toward mean direction? If you move toward something, it's a word that means direction. 
He said, I want you to understand the exceeding greatness of His power. So God has the power. I want you to understand the exceeding greatness of His power towards us. This is what Jesus said when He, when he said, I want you to go wait in Jerusalem. And I want you to wait there until you've received power that you can be witnesses for me. And what happened on the day of Pentecost? The power of God hit the church was born on the day of Pentecost with power. Miracle working. The anointing power of God. The, the same power in Acts 10, 8, or Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all that oppressed the devil. On the day of Pentecost, God anointed the church with Holy Ghost and power so the church can go about doing good, healing all that oppressed the devil, for God is with us. That's what happened. We're not some little mealy-mouthed Casper milk toast barely getting by asking for a handout. We are children of the King. We are joint heirs with the Lord Jesus. We looked last week at the fact that we have been seated together with Him in heavenly places, which is in chapter 2 of Ephesians. So I want you to understand what the power means to you. I want you to understand your inheritance. I want you to understand the working of His mighty power. And that, the, the next word for power here, the second word for power is a different word. It's the word kratos. Kratos means to exercise power by authority. So this is, this is the way that a king would rule in a kingdom. He, he operates in power in that kingdom because of his authority. That's what he's talking about. So I want you to operate in this miracle-working, dynamic, miraculous power because of your authority that you've been given. Yeah, we need the eyes of our understanding and lighten for this because I don't think we have a concept of it or, or a, a strong concept of it. I, I want a deeper understanding of it. Verse 20. This is a pretty good review, isn't it? <laughs> There's new stuff in here. Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him in his right hand in heaven. In other, in other words, in case you're wondering what power he's talking about, that he wants the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened so that you can understand this, I want you to understand how this power, in case you're wondering what power he's talking about, he's talking about the power that raised Christ from the dead. Now, if you don't mind, and I, I've, I've, I've alluded to this before, but I want you to see it in your Bible. Hold your place in your Bible right here and just... Flip back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, I mean, we could do a whole teaching on just the 8th chapter of Romans. It, it's an awesome book. This is the, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the uh, flesh but after the Spirit. That's that, that's that chapter. He tells us in verse 6, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and death. Because the carnal mind is enmity with God. Remember, being carnal minded, the the word, the Latin word, uh, carne, or for carnal here is meat. And minded is you know your mind is in your head, so don't be a meathead. Is what he's saying here. Is the is the actual translation. Don't be a meathead. Because the carnal mind is enmity with God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Now I want you to look in verse 11. Ah, verse 10. Verse 10. This is, you're going to look. And if Christ is in you. Now remember, remember this. Remember this. Christ is not Jesus' last name. Okay? When you see the word Christ by itself, you have to look at the context that it's written in. The word Christ by itself can mean Jesus of Nazareth. And that's all. The word Christ by itself can also refer to Jesus. But remember, the word Christ itself means the anointed one. Now, anointing, according to the book of Isaiah, 
The anointing of God is defined, biblically defined as, you want to write this down, the burden removing, yoke destroying power of God. And that word destroying in that verse of scripture means to pulverize into powder. So it's talking about a yoke, like a yoke, a, a, a yoke that you would use on a team of oxen. So, a lot of times what, what the picture is given there is that we are yoked to sin, or yoked to sickness, or yoked to poverty. And the anointing is the burden removing, yoke destroying, and it just doesn't mean that it breaks that yoke, because I guess that could be repaired. That word destroy there means to completely obliterate. Uh, it, it, it mean, like I said, it means to, to, uh, uh, to destroy, to, to turn into a powder. Complete, that yoke can never be used on you again. So the anointing is the burden removing, yoke destroying power of God. Remember the Bible tells you Christ in you, the hope of glory. <coughs> well, that verse of Scripture is certainly talking about Jesus, but it's also talking about the anointing of, or the power of God that's in you is the hope of glory. The same thing here in Romans chapter 8 and verse 10. And if Christ is in you, do you understand that the Bible doesn't teach us that Jesus is in you? Okay? Does Jesus have a body? <laughs> yes. Uh, is Jesus in a particular location right now? Yes, the Bible says He is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us, waiting for our, His enemies to be made His footstool. Right? So where is Jesus right now? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Is Jesus in your heart? Well, hang on, hang on before you answer. See, this is, this is what gets little children confused. Okay, boys and girls, would you like for Jesus to come into your heart? Well, a child thinks literally. They don't think abstractly. They think literally. And so they think, how is a grown man going to fit into my heart? I mean, if you... you <laughs> y'all know, know what chocolate mousse is, don't you? Dessert. Well, you say that around a child, and they're expecting, you know, a chocolate mousse. They, 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 they think... They don't think abstractly. They think concretely. So... It's confusing. Matter of fact, it confuses a lot of adults. Would you like Jesus to come into your heart? That's not what happens at the new birth. Listen to me, you're fixing to learn something. Please, please, no ugly cards and letters, okay? What happens when a, when a person is born again? When they call upon the Lord Jesus... When they acknowledge the price that has been paid for them. The third part of the Godhead, the Spirit of the living God, takes your enters you and recreates or makes alive unto God your spirit. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, We are a new creature in Christ. Actually, that's a new class of being. And so that's what happens. Jesus doesn't jump off of the throne and come into your heart. Okay, It's, 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 a, it's an act by the Spirit of God. The, the, the power of God makes alive or born again your spirit alive unto God. Now, don't get caught up with semantics here about, you know, is God omnipresent and stuff like that. Uh, God through His Spirit, yes. But I want to ask you this question. We think of omnipresent. Man, this is going to mess you up. We think of the word omnipresent mean, being, uh, in, being, being able to be in all places at one time. So God is everywhere all the time. I just want to ask you, is God in hell? In hell, one of the things of hell is separation from God. Well, if you're separated from God, is He there? then he's not everywhere, is he? What we confuse is, the Bible says that he is always with us. 
Now, we've learned a few weeks ago about when God spoke words and, and created everything, is His Word in everything? Yes. So is His presence by His Word in everything? Yes. But as, as far as Him fellowshipping and abiding, He is not everywhere. He's with you. So, and if, back to Romans 8, 10, and if Christ is in you, and if the burden removing, yoke destroying power of the living God by the Spirit of God is in you, your body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And then look at verse 11. But if the Spirit... Of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He's comparing what happens to you when you are born again to this. Just as the Spirit... Does it say right there that the Spirit raised Jesus? Come on. I mean, look in your Bible. This is not a trick question. It's an open book. Does it say in your Bible that the Spirit, the third part of the Godhead... Is what raised Jesus from the dead. Is that what your Bible says? Yes. So what happens when you call upon the name of the Lord? The Spirit of God in the same manner raises you from the dead. Same thing. It's the same way. Jesus doesn't hop off the throne and come into your heart. The power of the... You remember the power of the living God? The, the, the power of the God, uh, the power of the living God in Genesis chapter 1... When it says, and the Spirit of God began to move on the waters. That's the Spirit, that's the power of God that began to move in creation. We're talking about something that is awesome. And the Bible says that our body is the temple of, this spirit, of the Spirit of God. That's a big deal. I mean, we, we take it to mean, well, you know, our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So, we shouldn't wear makeup. Well, the, 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 we, the, the temple of, of our bodies is the temple of the Holy Ghost. We, <clears throat> we should dress a certain way. We should do our hair a certain way. We, well, are we supposed to do all things uh, to glorify God? Well, certainly we are. But that's not what that's talking about. When, you're, when it, the Bible talks about your body being the temple of the Holy Ghost, it's talking about the power of the third part of the Godhead, the living God, residing on the inside of you with your spirit. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit become united. That's how you communicate with the Father, isn't it? In that Romans chapter, uh, if we continue reading here in chapter 8 and get down to verses 26 through 28, it's how it tells you that we communicate with God. We communicate with Him. Listen, the highest level of communication you have with God is spirit to spirit. It's not asking Him to make a traffic light turn green for you if, you were, if you're supposed to get that job. The devil can make traffic lights turn too. The highest level of communication... The most sure way of communication between us and God is spirit to spirit. It's just that most people don't learn or don't make themselves sensitive to that. They are far more comfortable with things in the natural. You can be deceived by things in the natural. But when God, listen, when God speaks to you spirit to spirit, He can speak a word or two and things open up and you see the whole thing. It's not just a word-to-word -word communication like we do. We have to communicate word-to-word. God, when God speaks a word in the Spirit, it can open up His whole plan for you. Okay. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, which if you're born again, He does, He will also, King James Bible says, quicken your mortal body, but the word quicken means what it says here in the New King James Bible. He will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Did you get that? If the Spirit of Him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, abides in you, if you're born again, 
Okay, that's what he's talking about. If you're saved, if you're born again, that Spirit dwells on the inside of you. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead will quicken or make alive your physical body. You know, that's a good thing to know. That's a good thing to call on where your physical body is concerned. I've shared with you before. I'm sure I'm going to share with you many more times. Most believers do not know or understand how to operate or walk in their authority that God has given us. You have far more power and authority than you think you do. Now, who is it do you think that would try to keep the church from knowing that? It'd be the enemy, wouldn't it? He's the one that doesn't want... So all kinds of junky doctrine has gotten in the church. Well, this stuff has passed away. That was for the early church. I, I've been waiting for somebody to, to define for me early church. What is the early church? When does that stop? What, what's the date? Was it November the 31st, 305 A.D., that it no longer became the early church? It's now the, it, it went from the early church to the mid-church. And then once the early church was gone away, none of this stuff worked anymore. Well, listen, can I share something with you? I don't think that way. You may have noticed that. I don't think that way. Matter of fact, I am not looking for reasons of why God won't do something on my behalf. I know that I happen to be one of God's favorites. My picture is on his refrigerator. In case you're one, I'm one of his favorites. Yours is too. Yours is too. But I believe that if God did it for anybody, he'll do it for me. Because he's no respecter of persons. If he did that for the early church and he doesn't do it for us, that's a violation of his word. And do you think that the enemy quit after the early church? Okay, well, we don't need this stuff anymore because the devil has been defeated. The devil has been defeated. Jesus defeated him. However, we are an occupying army that has been all too willing to give authority back to him in our lives and in, in, in our country and, and worldwide. See, he didn't have any authority until we gave it to him. Because Jesus had all the authority and he gave it to the church. So the early church had the authority and they messed up and gave some of it back to the devil. Do you remember, can you imagine how the devil fought the very first time he ever defeated a Christian? Can you imagine what it was like for the devil on the day of Pentecost? Here, 120 people are, are, are in a room a chamber, and they've been there for, depending on who you're talking to, between eight and ten days. They've been in this room. Jesus told over 500 people to be there. But they, uh, you know, 380 of them had stuff to do. You know, had PTA meeting, soccer practice, yeah, Lord, i got to go grocery shopping. Uh, you know, just had stuff to do, and they didn't make it. Don't you know the day after Pentecost they wished they'd have been there? So the day of Pentecost hits. And the devil has had a time with Jesus for particularly the last three and a half years. The de Jesus has defeated the devil at every turn and made a show of it. Finally, the devil thinks that he's killed him and that didn't turn out so good. Because he took him to hell, and the Bible said that, <laughs> that Jesus made a show of him openly. When the power of God came into hell and resurrected Jesus, oh my goodness. And then the Bible says that Jesus actually preached to the captives that were in Abraham's bosom and took them out. The graves were opened up. Remember that? that it's in the Easter story. So, after that event, don't you know the devil thought, Phew, I am glad that's over with. That Jesus was a thorn in my side. To be quite frank with all of you, I'm glad he's gone back to heaven. 
Now maybe we can have a little peace and relaxation. Eight to ten days later, remember Jesus ministered for 40, 40 days after his resurrection. So they're not in this upper room for 50 days. They're, Jesus has been ministering for 40 days, then tells them to go to Jerusalem. So they've only been there eight to ten days. And now all of a sudden, that same anointing, that same power that resided on him has now hit 120 people. His worst nightmare. Not, not, not only does he, he, he doesn't have just one to contend with, he's got 120, and you have to understand, the devil recognizes that power. He recognizes that authority. Whether we do or not, he does. And, and I'm, I'm thinking it's very possible at that point. Now, I don't know. I, I don't have, I, 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 I don't know this for sure. But I think at that point, the devil had a nervous breakdown. Yeah, I think he was in bed for, for weeks after that. I mean, you know, what, what am I going to do? He had an ice pack on his head. He's, you know, he, <laughs> what are we going to do? And then one day, they found a believer that spoke something out of their mouth contrary to what the Word says. Contrary to what the covenant said. And the devil, whoa, 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 what? What did he say? And some, I don't know what they did, but they could have said something like, well, you know, dear Lord, you know, the people down the street, everybody's getting sick. I know, you know, our family, we'll get it too. You know, people are getting laid off. down there at the factory and you know you know how our luck is if anybody gets laid off it'll be me and the devil listens to that because what that person's doing is giving the enemy authority over you that's how he gets authority over you he doesn't have any on his own he uses your authority against you when you speak something that is contrary to the word that is why it is so important to watch what comes out of your mouth. But the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. Okay, back to Ephesians chapter 1. I want the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened. Verse 20 which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. That's what He's talking about. What we've just been talking about. Romans 8. This is what He's talking about here. Verse 21. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is a name. So He says, when He raised Christ from the dead, where did He raise Him to? Far above. Power and might and dominion and every name that is named. So He raised Him above the power of the enemy. Now, I want you to look over in verse 6 of the next chapter. Just look across the page. And He's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. So, you look at that over there in chapter 1. He, and He raised Christ above principality and power and might and dominion. God looks at it as you were raised with Jesus also. That's the way He looks at you. And remember, we look at, we're looking at a time that that's going to happen in our life. God doesn't do that. God looks at all of time at one time. To Him, you're already there. To Him, he, He's not limited by time. He sees us already there. And I'm sure it's puzzling to him, since he sees us there, I'm sure it puzzles him as to why he doesn't see us operating in the authority that we should be operating in, because that's where we are. Do you see why the Apostle Paul said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened? There's a lot to this, isn't there? Verse 22, and he put all things under his feet. By the way, if he put all things under his feet, 
uh, Jesus' feet would be part of His body, wouldn't they? Well, aren't we the body of Christ? Well, He put them under, our, he put them under us also. And gave Him to be head over all things the church, which is the body and the fullness of Him who fills all. Now, what I want you to do where this is concerned, I want you to pray this prayer over you. And I want you to make it personal. Verse 17. I, I, I'm just going to go through a little bit of it to show you what I'm talking about. And Go to verse 17. And, and pray this prayer over you. Pray, God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, I ask that you give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, that the eyes of my understanding are being enlightened, and that I may know what is the hope of your calling in my life and what are the riches of the glory of my inheritance with the saints. Do you see what I'm talking about? You see how I'm doing that? Pray this prayer over yourself. Pray this prayer over your family. Put their name in there. When you have a dear friend that says, I'm just going through a tough time. Can you pray for me? Pray this prayer. If you don't know how you need to pray for them, pray this prayer over them. Because what I have found is, when the eyes of people's understanding are enlightened, they can see what to do. They can see what direction they need to go through in their life. Amen? All right, we're going to stop there for today. That, uh, that pretty much winds up my review. <laughs> Next week, we'll be talking about the prayer that's in Ephesians chapter 3, which is a really good one also. And these two prayers together, uh, man, they are, they are dynamic for the believer. Amen? Well, I hope you learned something today. today. My desire for you is that God's richest and best are yours. And remember, there's victory in Jesus. Amen. As I tithe and give offerings, I'm believing the Lord for vision and direction, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my financial needs, that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you agree with that, say amen.